week, we're joined by Matt Blazek from Union Maine, um, and we're going to be talking about um, education and uh, how people can start uh, educating the public. And um, I guess, Matt, I think the best thing you could do is tell us about yourself and uh, your story first. I'll uh, pass it over to yourself, Matt. Oh, thanks, Andrew. Um, yeah, so uh, I'm Matt Blazek. I live in Union, Maine, a little very small, small town here in the United States, uh, the East Coast. So, you know, the, that one of the older coasts, as we like to call it, full of our own you know, history, wherever where you look. And I uh, am, I've been a reenactor now for well, actually, I don't want to say reenactor. I, I, I've started to move away from the term reenactor because, uh, in, in my mind, reenactors are like actually reenacting a specific time and event or something like that. And I'm trying to train myself to not really use that term anymore. I'm, I'm a living historian or, or historical interpreter is what I'm trying to use more these days. So mm -hmm. I'm a historical interpreter. Um, been doing that. Uh, sort of amateurishly for the past 20 years now. And since 2017, I've been doing a lecture series uh, called The Agincourt Soldier. That's the time frame that I uh, specialize in, that sort of late Hundred Years' War, Lancastrian era um, time frame. And so since 2017, I've been doing lectures uh, for schools and libraries and things like that. And then 2020, I founded the educational nonprofit uh, History Live Northeast, and we are a 501c3 educational nonprofit. We travel to schools, libraries, other nonprofits, uh, doing a, a couple of lecture series. We do still do the Agincourt Soldier. I rolled that into it, and we've added the Popham Soldier, which is a 1607 Popham colony, which is the first english colony here in maine that was founded around the same time as jamestown it didn't last though it only lasted about a year so about 14 months so that's my way of sort of rolling in maine history and we're going to be expanding within the next few years to include the knox soldier which is american civil war history and you know as any good founder i uh, styled myself as executive director of the organization and yeah we're sort of just constantly growing and looking for new programs to put out. We work with schools across Maine and libraries across Maine. We're trying to branch out into other New England states. Uh, uh, but right now, it, it, when I say we, I'm sort of using the royal we. <laughs> I, it, I'm just a one-man one man operation right now. I do have a, a great, very supportive board of directors that sort of steers me in the right direction and keeps me on track. But all the day-to-day -day operations and the historical interpretation stuff is – just me, so mm. um, sort of. And the best thing about everything we do is if we're doing it for a school or library, it is 100% free. We do not ask them to, we don't charge them to come in to do talks. We do always accept donations though, because donations, donations are great. <laughs> uh, pay, helps pay for the gas and lunch usually at least. Uh, but we are trying to be 100% donation and grant funded, which is, um, a little difficult but things are uh things are getting there and picking up steam and of course 2020 came around and all the schools shut down so that sort of put a, a slight damper uh on on our growth but 2021 is looking to be uh, the, the 2021 2022 school year is looking to be pretty amazing we've already got a number of shows lined up uh it's pretty pretty great what people you know who wants us to come in and do talks and things like that Wow, that's great. I mean, uh, obviously, um, 2020 was a was a bit of a challenge for all of us, but uh, yeah. with the year, things are uh, starting to pick up a head of steam. Um, I'm really, really glad to hear that. So you've got a lot of projects under your belt. Um, I follow you on social media, so I can definitely see um, what you've got going on there and and um, you've definitely helped me out uh, on a couple of my projects uh, in my earlier days, um, which is always very well appreciated. And I guess you've had um, your online conferences, which uh, are fantastic. It, I guess to the, the casual observer, um, you, 
it would be quite intimidating to see you, you know, as as you're as you're growing, and um, if someone was trying to start off engaging with the community, um, wanting to to have a project, maybe not like yours or similar to yours. How how would they how would they start? How would someone want to be able to engage with the community? Maybe not have a a non for profit, maybe a, a, a for profit, or even even a reenactment group or a living history group wanting to. Um, start educating about their period. Um. Well, that's first. Let me say thank you, uh, or you're welcome for the for the help. It's always great to hear that I've helped anyone in in, in any fashion uh, with their portrayals or whatever they're doing. So that uh, makes you feel good to hear. Uh, and thank you for that. It, um, yeah. So first of all, I, I have to say I could not do this if it wasn't for my wife. <laughs> She is amazingly supportive. She's an amazingly supportive partner. She helps me when I need help. And I'm very fortunate that she also has um, a career that that can help sort of stem the uh, cost of some of this. Um, my, my, my primary role, even though I have this great nonprofit going on, is, is I am a stay-at-home dad. Um, so I do have some free time to be able to do sort of these lofty goals that I set. I, I've made big plans um originally when i first started this i said you know i was looking at what was taught in schools for history and i have some really great teacher friends they're they're fantastic teachers but i noticed that not by any fault of their own just sort of the mandated curriculum that's put out there they really glossed over a lot of things and they really sort of fed poor information and they didn't really teach people how to look at history. They, they really approached it as this, this is what happened. This is what you need to know. That's all that all, that's all that matters. And I'm like, no, there's so much, so much more. And there's so much more to all of this. So I was, I first wrote down this plan. I was, I was working in um, a financial center call bank basically i was taking calls for eight to ten hours a day listening to people complain about their 401ks so i sat down one day and said okay if i if i wanted to do something what would i do and i, I basically sat down and and came up with a like a 10-year plan for this and now i'm not saying that anybody who, who wants to start doing this has to come up with something that that detailed and although mine wasn't really detailed it was really just an outline but Really, to get started, you do, you do have to have a plan. What, what's your goal? Do you just want to get out there and talk to people? Do you ju do you want to get into schools and help schools enrich their curriculum? Do you want to start your own living history group? And having that sort of five-year, ten-year plan written down, even if it's just a bare-bone guidelines, it gives you kind of a roadmap to follow and have and has goals to set. And I'm very goal driven, and that's what helps me me see through all these things: is finishing one project, moving on to the next, and saying, "Okay, this week I'm going to finish this, or even this year I'm going to finish this, and then I can move on to something else." So originally, the plan for for what I'm doing started out as just the lecture series, um, and I said, "You know, I have all this stuff, I have all this knowledge, I have a theater background, so I'm used to getting up in front of people and talking." How would I how would I make this happen? And then in in October of 2016, so the year after Agincourt's 500 uh, 600th anniversary, I got uh, I was looking through our local libraries sort of website, and they had a notice for National History Month. So I guess in October in the U.S. it's National History Month. So I went to them and said, Hey, I know it's you know late notice. You know, I do this, I have all this history talk I could do for the Battle of Agincourt, which which actually happened October the, the, the 25th. So I could do the talk on October the 25th. And they said, you know, actually, great, come on in. So I brought in a bunch of stuff. I made up a quick PowerPoint and I went in and then I gave a talk on the Battle of Agincourt on Agincourt Day, October the 25th. And people liked it and, and I really loved doing it. So I said, you know, maybe maybe I need to figure out how to do this. And then a couple of things happened. I changed jobs and we had our our second child and a couple she was about two years old and i said you know what i um i am 
terrified to go back to work to a regular desk job or a day-to-day desk job. I don't want to do it. So that's when I finally said, I came across my five-year plan and I, I did some adjusting to it. And I said, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to see if I can do this. And I, I met with some sort of business coaches, uh, ones who had nonprofit experience. Because from the beginning, I said to myself, you know, I, I want it to be free to schools. Uh, because schools in the, U, in the U.S., a lot of them don't have a lot of free money for stuff like this. So I said, you know, I want this to be free. I want this to be accessible and free. Mm. And and I had I had friends at the time who were were like they'll they'll never do it for free. They're, once you say free, they're going to think that you are some nut job who doesn't know what he's talking about, and you're not a professional and you don't want to do it. So I said, well, that means I need to make myself look like a professional. I need to pre- present a professional front, and that's when I really got into sort of branding it and the the social media of it and things like that, saying you know I'm a professional. We are professional service. We are a 501c3 educational nonprofit. I heard all that, registered with the state, registered with the feds, and got the got the website and said, this is this is what this is what we do. And, and I, I tried to present that sort of very polished professional uh, outward appearance towards you know to schools and everybody. It's everybody that I that I come in contact with. And eventually, I, I, I guess you could say, the, the, you know, almost fake it till you make it, I, I feel like I have become a professional living historical interpreter or living historian. So, um, and I've built up contacts throughout sort of interpreter and museum fields. And, and that's sort of another aspect of this. So while I love the lecture series, and that is our sort of backbone to what everything we do, I also came up with the idea of creating a mobile museum exhibit. Um, I'm from a very rural part of Maine, and there are a lot of people in Maine, especially farther north from me, where they may never have the experience of being able to go to a real sort of history museum, or a, like they, they probably will never get down to the uh, to the uh, the Metropolitan Museum of Art to see the Arms and Armor exhibit. They I may mean, never get to the Wor- uh, Worcester Art Museum to get to see the Higgins Armory collection. So I said, you know, how can we make it accessible to people and excite them about this kind of things? So I said, you know, uh, a, a mobile exhibit. We create a professionally designed museum a, a, and curated museum exhibit, and we take it to people. And things have sort of grown from there. We started build, building the collection. Now I will say our collection is it's replicas we don't have anything original at this time if we could ever add something original that'd be fantastic but we're we're, we are not disingenuous about what we have you know we we are honest in saying that these are replicas these are representations of what would have been worn and, and used and through that i've met some really interesting people and we decided that we were going to create an app to go along with the museum exhibit. Because what's what's the one thing that, not even just every kid, what's the one thing every person wants to do when they get into an arms and armor exhibit anywhere? They want to pick it up. <laughs> they want to hold it. They want to try it. And I know I want to. Whenever I go to these places, I'm like, if I could just touch, if I could just touch that Negroli for two seconds, I promise I won't hurt it. <laughs> but, <laughs> but so we decided to make this app and what we're doing is we are um 3d scanning the replicas and creating 3d models and what will happen is when these kids or or visitors go in to see the exhibit on their smart device they'll be able to bring up the app so with this app they'll be able to go in and the app will sort of use these key images that'll go along with the exhibit and we're actually using trading cards. So, so visitors will be able to take trading cards, a full set with them of everything that they see that will still be able to use with the app once they leave. And what that will do is that on their smart device, once they scan that key image, it'll bring up the 3D model we're using. And they'll be able to rotate it, zoom in, zoom out. Um, there's going to be you know, almost like a museum placard of information about it links to originals in different museum collections 
videos of items being mm. used the way they would have been used. Uh, or are you also working on one where they'll be able to virtually like try on like a helmet or something wow. and then, then take their snap their picture. So this is something we're hoping to, after we've got it all figured out, sort of farm out to other museums mm. um, to enrich their their museum experience as well. So that's something that we're hoping once we're able to do that that will be an income revenue to support the free programs that go on. Yeah. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, so I mean, these are all things that we're working on. Uh, when, I, uh, when I say we, I mean, I do have people, professionals, like my, the, the guy working for the app on me, his name's Ian Donnelly. He's actually a um, extended reality designer for Penn State. So he's, He's somebody who's done a really good job, and we're hoping to have the the prototype up for that very soon. But, and then of course we're always we're doing stuff like this collaborations with other historians, with other um, reenactors. You know, um, Ari, um, Eileen, and I from you know Ari is from the Turnip of Terror. We are constantly doing stuff together. We actually have yeah. our own podcast together, that How to Medieval podcast, which you've been on. Thank you very much. And so we're always finding more things to do with other people and uh, the more you do the more it gets your your name out there and the more sort of a network you build up mm. and we we sort of help each other spread around whatever we're all doing it, it's really great it's some of the, well, the aspects of all this I, I really like so to, to better answer the question <laughs> instead of that long meandering if you, this is something you want to do, you got to have a little bit of planning, and then you just got to have the audacity to do it. Mm. And, and really, it's just sort of start doing it. You know, if you want to do lectures, find friends who are teachers and say, especially history teachers, and say, hey, I'm doing this lecture stuff now. Can I come in and talk to your class? Um, go to anywhere that will have you talk. Literally, I'm doing a talk on September 30th at a brewery. Um, we're going to be talking about how to build and launch a trebuchet because that's something I, I, I added to the lecture series. For, I, I built <laughs> a trebuchet, an eight-foot-tall trebuchet that I bring to places and then launch cantaloupes out of when it works. Yeah. But so we're going to we're going to a brewery. We're going to be doing a talk at a brewery. Um, yeah. You know, libraries museums historical societies i just did a talk at a county fair i was basically entertainment for an hour at, at one of the local fairs so really if you want to get your name out there and, and try to make a go of it just anywhere that will that will have you and, and have any amount of ears that will listen to you get in there and do it um and you, you meet a lot of interesting people doing it I've, I've had a lot of fun doing it over the past couple of years and I'm hoping to do more of it now that things are starting to hopefully loosen up a little bit more. Wow. I mean, thanks for sharing that. Um, it, it seems that um, you've got, yeah, definitely big plans. Um, and I think the takeaway from that is is that of of all all of the all of the um, planning and and execution um is as you said um definitely going out there making those connections but also presenting yourself as as a credible and um professional figure um you know having having yourself uh with not 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 only uh, a you don't i i guess you don't need to have uh, a really professional looking digital setup but you know when you're when you're contacting um you know organizations especially schools you probably should have a an organization's website um listing what you do you probably should have an organizational um email address you probably shouldn't be um contacting them with your personal email which might might not be professional because schools schools are definitely looking for uh, organizations, not individuals um, who might be a little bit sketchy or, you know, appearing to be unprofessional because they're working with children. Um, so those are things. If you if you are looking 
to uh, engage with schools. Um, you know, think about that. Uh, one of the one of the best things I ever did, which really helped me a lot, I think, is I actually went and got certified to be a substitute teacher. Oh. And you so you actually go through and they'll they'll at least in the U.S. what you do or and at least in Maine in the U.S. I'm not sure if it's the same for everywhere else, but you know you you pay for the state to do a background check on you, the Department of Education, and you go and you get fingerprinted and things like that, and then they give you a, a basically a card that says you know you're a certified sub for five years, come back in five years and re up it. Nice. And then I, I actually was a substitute teacher for so between my financial call center days. And what I'm doing now, I worked for a vineyard for for two years. <laughs> complete yeah. complete change. So I was actually the, the the assistant farm director for a local vineyard. And you you in Maine you can't do that in the winter, of course. Mm. So I said, you know, how am I gonna how am I gonna do this? Um, how am I gonna basically have income in the winter? I became a substitute teacher. And that was sort of my inroad to a lot of schools around here. Was I started subbing all these classes, and that just gave me another tool in my sort of tool chest where, you know, people asking, you know, it's like, so we want to come to your school. How, you know, but how do we know? It's like, well, so I'm a certified substitute teacher. Here's my substitute credentials. And they're like, oh, great, cool. You're awesome. Perfect. Come on in. Because it's just that sort of other level of you're a safe person. Yeah. To come in and, and, and do this. And it, it also, like I said, it, it, it also gave me insight as to sort of how, the schools work in a lot of these different ways the next thing about also being you know presenting yourself as being credible as you said is you do also have to work at being credible um because if you go in there and start just talking about things that you don't really know about you're not going to last that long mm. they, they will catch on to you and they'll be like this 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 guy's a hack we don't you know we're not going to have him come back again mm. So there, there, there is that. I mean, I'm lucky enough to say where you know I've been you know, studying this stuff for 20 years now. I've branched out a lot more. I used to be focused only on armor. Armor was my thing. I love armor. I love different styles of armor. I used to just research armor, and uh, then I sort of found that armor doesn't exist in a vacuum it's there's reasons for the armor and not just military reasons for the armor but but social reasons for the armor and the social structure of supporting those who afford the armor and the whole military system and how it's ingrained especially so i focus on like i said later medieval england that military system that's sort of ingrained within the entire structure of everything that's going on so i, I had to branch out and i had to move away from everything because especially when you're talking to schools and things, they don't just want to learn about armor. They want to learn, you have to sort of find the hook of how it fits into their curriculum demands. Mm. While, at least for Maine, the, the social studies curriculum demand, especially history demand of it, is rather, it's a little looser defined than a lot of other things. But they do have things like, you know, they want to see the evolution of, technology, you know, social structures, uh, daily life, things like that, and then, you know, juxtaposing daily life to modern life and, and things like that. So you, you got to dig a little deeper into everything else to sort of build a program that fits what they're, what they're, what they want to know, what they're, what they're learning. And, and that means talking to teachers and, and talking to the state. Luckily, in the you know, United States, all of these states' curriculums are public knowledge. You can find them. You can look them up online and, and read them. It also, you have to work with the teachers because here, like I said, every teacher sort of has their the ability to sort of define how they're meeting that end goal on the history part of it so you need to have sort of a stable of topics to trot out to fit what that teacher wants to teach these kids and then of course you got to make sure that 
you know what you're talking about because really if if you want to get in this to to actually teach people if if you don't know what you're talking about then you're you're not doing anybody a service at all you're just perpetuating myths and misnomers mm. well that's i mean that's a one one other topic in itself isn't it um oh yeah the, the perpetuation of myths and misnomers um and and i guess we do see that um in well i'm not going to point fingers but uh you know you do see that in the community itself um and you know at, at events or you know in, you might uh, walk past a, a group um perhaps miscommunicating things that that they've been taught and i think that's why getting into schools or, or getting into um other other organizations you know be you know be presenting at a at a, at a beer fest or, or a brewery or you know a county fair or, or or wherever else and and um getting people thinking about history in in different ways is is very important uh um, i'll tell you, i'll tell you right now i have never had a kid tell me something that wasn't correct <laughs> <laughs> to be perfectly honest. I've never had a kid perpetuate any of those long, brought out, you know, drawn out myths of knights couldn't get up or or the, it's almost always adults. So uh, I give props to the sort of the history teachers or the history curriculum that's changed that mm. they're, they're they're teaching these kids the right stuff for the most part. There's still some stuff that's like, yeah, that's a little a little suspect. But you know, you also have to be afraid when you're doing this. Never be afraid to say, I don't know, mm. because you're going to get – kids ask some fantastic questions, and they can also sort of tell when you're making stuff up. So don't be afraid to say, I don't know, but don't just leave it at I don't know. Say, you know, I don't know, but – I may have friends who know more about this. Mm. It's, it's like I may have, you know, some kid might come up and say, you know, ask me, well, were there com were, were 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 commoners knights? Could could a commoner be a knight? And I'd be like, well, you know, I I don't really know that. But my friend Andrew sort of specializes in that field. I can ask him for you, and then I'll email your teacher with 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 the answer. Mm. Just then, if you ever do that, make sure you, you have to follow through on that. Of course, you can't, yeah. can't leave me hanging. Yeah. No, oh, no, absolutely. Um, I I've always found that um, children are very canny, um, very bright, um, and often uh, dismissed by um, by people. And and that's a that is absolutely a shame um, because those those questions those burning those burning questions need to be answered because uh, if we're bobbing them off or providing with incorrect information, I mean just from just from a, a very um, basic level, those children are potential reenactors. Or, or in general, those those are people who are trying to learn more about the world, and by providing them with correct and um, it, it, as much as up to date and relevant information as as we can, we're informing them more about the world. So it's 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 entirely um, uh, correct to to say I don't know, uh, and it's the intellectually honest thing to do. I'm a firm believer of that the old saying of you know those who don't study history are bound or doomed to repeat it or whatever the the actual real saying is. <laughs> and the the problem is we have all basically been taught that history is boring. And that's why people don't want to learn about history. And I feel what I'm trying to do here is to get 
people excited about learning about history because if we get them excited to learn about history real history mm. then maybe we can start fixing some of the problems that are out there because the more i learn about history the more i look at things and i'm like god we're just repeating history over and over and over again because nobody's learning from it yeah yeah I, I would I would absolutely agree with that. Um, that one of the one of the things that I encounter a lot through this channel um, and just in general is that people will will say, look, I'm I'm not interested in history. I found history boring in school, which um, I I personally didn't, funnily enough. But um, in and a lot of that is because um, History is taught, uh, well, at least when, when I was younger, history was taught in the great man narrative, you know, places, dates, and names. Exactly. Um, and that unfortunately does not um, inform people about um, people. It doesn't inform people about the, the social and political uh, changes in the world and, and the, the, the material causes and the social causes that impact and brought us to where we are right now. Um, and the, the way that I try to teach history is informing people how we've arrived to where we are. Um, and, and you do too. Um, so we, we, we agree on that. Um, I don't ever try to um, draw a concludent, however, I, I never try to say, and that is why this. I always try to provide an, an just the information and say, well, this is why this has happened. This in the past, this is this is the cause and effect of this event there. Um, and I don't try to draw the concludent of um, based on my personal um, experiences. I mean, but you know, you you'll always have your own biases and that 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 will um will impact your views on things that's that's a that's a fact uh, well, learning to learning to yeah. one of the biggest challenges of doing anything in history is learning to sort of check your biases at the door yeah, um, yeah absolutely and, and try to really dig into what what really happened mm. my whole approach to all of this is trying to find the, the the story or the narrative behind us because and it's probably because of my my theater background and also I was an English major in college so that probably has something to do with it as well but people I found people listen to stories and I don't mean stories like well once upon a time just like the sort of the, the narrative of of, of everything because if mm -hmm. I told if I look at it, the, the person actually maybe, maybe not you of, of course because we're, we're we're both geeks here so we get this but you know, the, the common person on the street, if I said, hey, you want to hear an hour long lecture about the late Lancastrian era, hundred years war and the battle and Henry V's siege of Harfleur and campaign across France for the Battle of Agincourt. Most people would be like, no, I don't want to sit there for an hour and listen to that. If I said, hey, do you want to hear a story about how six thousand or I'm sorry, about how nine thousand. English knights were able to defeat 15,000 elite French troops all within a day while battling in the mud. And most people will be like, yeah, that sounds awesome. I want to hear that. So, so yeah. that's what I mean. And, and I'm not like, I don't try to like, I don't act it out. And I don't, I don't, I, mean, I, try, I try to make it entertaining and comical mm. at least when I'm doing these things, because People, if I've learned, you know, people remember being entertained far more than they remember being taught. Yes. For, for the most part. And they remember the experience. And if they remember any of the actual information, that's fantastic. I mean, that, that's like icing on the cake for me. But if they walk out of there saying, hey, you know what? Maybe history isn't that bad. Maybe I do want to learn some more about this stuff, about whatever era actually interests them the most. Because a lot of that, is what this is i mean personally i don't you know care for 
civil like 18th century civil war era history i i, I don't i don't care about it I mean, that sounds coarse i do care about it in the societal ramifications that it's had mm, mm. and i i do believe that we should learn about it and educate ourselves about it as the way that's still affecting the you know american landscape as it is today yeah but you know uh, that it's, that said i'm as as someone who's not from america it's it's something that's not important to me much as yeah. much as historically you would not be in it say for example the maori wars would not be important to you yeah, you, it, you you probably wouldn't even know they existed i i'll be honest i i have no idea what the maori wars are you see um that I, wasn't I the, know. yeah sorry that was the, that, that wasn't the war what war was it where they fought all the emus so, uh, just well, see, the, yeah, the emu, emu war, right? People, oh, okay. people know people know that about Australia because it's it's a joke online, but yeah. um, because people remember entertainment, people, yeah, that's right, exactly. Um, so things, sorry, well, sorry, the, the, the Maori were. The, I'm sorry, the the, the, the Maori uh, uh, indigenous indigenous people of New Zealand. Is that correct? Is that... That's right. That's right. Okay. And, yeah. And, yeah. So, so my my point being that um there there are parts of there are parts of uh u s history um which which perhaps aren't aren't interesting to everybody um but but are still significant um and are important um so not all history not all history is 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 interesting but still is significant and important because all history is significant and important to reach us to the point that we we are here today yeah, that's yeah. right so uh, my point is being it's like so it's like i'm not going to sit down and read a biography about grant you know mm. I, I i just don't care i don't care to read about grant it's like that's he's, he's it's not what i'm interested in but somebody is interested in that mm. somebody might be really interested in that and not even know it yet because they think history is boring so if they walk away from that saying you know well maybe history isn't boring maybe i do want to read that biography on grant because it's been sitting you know it's been sitting in my living room for for two years because somebody gave it to me yeah you know, maybe that'll be the catalyst to get them to do that, and and they'll walk away from a, a, with a greater appreciation of of learning about history. So that, that's really what a lot of my end goal is, especially in you know younger students. It's trying to get them interested in learning about yeah. it, because I, like you said, when I went through high school, I I hated I, I hated history. I did, I did not like a history class at all. I don't even really remember my high school history classes. I just remember that I didn't like it. Mm. And I, I had to go through college before I ended up taking a history course about the history of the Silk Road. And I thought it found it was fascinating. It, it, and because it explained so much more than just and in 1842 they stormed this place. And in 1847 they stormed it. So it's like or there, was, or there was this battle, and then this battle, and then it's like, in America especially, and I don't know if it's the same thing in, in Australia or New Zealand, possibly it could be the same thing in, in Britain, but everything is sort of, uh, uh, U.S. history is built on battle to battle. Yeah. You know, yes. you, you'd think that everywhere, it's like you learn about the, Revolutionary War, mm. you learn about the Civil War, you learn about World War II, mm. and they, they they even sort of glossed over World War One. So it, it's just the the big American wars, I guess you could call it, that they that they get into. So part of me, yeah, I'm I'm developing a, a Revolutionary War unit just because I feel if I want to stay viable and competitive and get out there into schools i think that's something that they're that they're going to want um 
and it just gives me more things. And if I can get in there, you, you know, with the, with the Popham soldier or the the Knox soldier as it's called, maybe I can then sort of sell them on bringing the medieval one in in too. Mm. Um, so that's sort of a calculated. I I I I don't mind American Revolution history. It's close enough to that sort of medieval pre-colonial era that I, I really, really like. Um, and then the more I, the more information I learn about it, the more, the more interesting I do find it to be perfectly honest, because basically you don't, in high school, when I originally took those courses, we, I didn't learn what was his, what was actually interesting about it. It was just the, you know, this battle is this date. And then this battle is this date and stuff like that. And that, that, really does a disservice to history mm, um, and it does, does a disservice to good to good teachers too yeah no no you, you're 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 correct and um i think that i mean i can't i can't really comment too much on on current um curricula um on what what was taught but we we definitely had had similar which was um people showing up in a place um and then what wars were fought um you know and that tended to be more arrival of um the europeans so you know settlers so then then early colonial uh life then world war one world war two that that was basically it so and and that once again was sort of um battles um so the, the the same kind of thing um establishment of of the the country and then um a whole bunch of wars uh lots of lots of uh focus on world war one though because that's part of the sort of national um identity it's interesting in the united states world war Two is much more part of the national identity than world war one mm. uh, i find that I find that very in interesting um, as to why that. Why I don't know why that is, especially because I the, the, the U.S. came into World War II very, very late, almost at the end of the war, mm -hmm. and you know uh, we sort of have this nationalistic, you know, oh well, we won the war for the Allies. Well, I mean, it was already sort of going to happen anyways. We just sort of sealed the deal a little bit. It wasn't. It wasn't like everything was going totally to pot for the allies we just sort of you know it was the final nail in the coffin i guess you could say yeah i, I mean that's that's a few hundred years outside my wheelhouse <laughs> yeah, me, too. me too me too i'm not i studied it but that was over 20 years ago so um my history teacher would be rolling in the grave i'm just, oh, i don't think she's dead i hope she's not dead but... <laughs> very good um but uh yeah yeah don't really remember much about world war ii i'll leave that to much more experienced people in that field to um comment down below <laughs> i would be interesting to learn about it. i wonder if it's if if it's because it's so much fresher in our in our in our mind as history that that we make such a big deal out of over here i i it's like my grandfather who who just he died three years ago now but he but he fought in world war ii so it's there's still a few and there's still a handful of yeah. world war ii veterans out there mm. so so maybe that's why maybe that's that's why that it's it's promoted so much more in classes than say world war one because i mean they're still here it's 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 still i don't know yeah. i mean yeah, I, I genuinely don't know. Um, hmm. Yeah, I'd be interested to, if anyone does know, I'd be interested to see if they could give us an idea. Yeah, um, I'd love to. Mm, definitely like to know. Um, yeah, I mean, I, 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 I do know why um, World War One is is part of like the the New Zealand and the Australian um, national identity because of. Um, the, the how you know and that's that's a huge that's a huge thing that would 
not really part of this this channel yeah. and um you know focusing more on the you know, medieval but you know how um how so, the um post-colonial period and and how after world war world war one both australia and, and, and new zealand sort of moved away from um britain and developed their own national identity post world war one so oh, yeah. you know, that's under that turning point for for, so, for the, both those nations using world war ii as sort of a, a, a segue because of some of the you know very touchy subjects that come up in, in world war mm. ii reena reenacting and you know um, living history and historical interpretation well, one of the other reasons that, that i'm doing what i'm doing is to sort of try to put a band-aid on the the, the um hole in the dam here the crack in the dam um of things that are creeping into public history and um medieval history and and things like that specifically the you know the, the this sort of constant infiltration of white supremacy and co-opting of white supremacist medieval symbols for white supremacist matters and things like that mm -hmm. you know i really try to put a nail in that right off I, a fourth grader once asked me and this is a fourth grader asked me why are there no people of color in medieval manuscripts? Mm. And I went on this great, I'm like, well, actually, no, there is. And I went on this huge, long, basically, I was doing an arms and armor talk, and I went on this huge, like, 20-minute tangent of how richly diverse medieval Europe was and you know, sort of went on that talk of that. And they're like, and, and I ended up emailing them, you know, images and, and references and things like that saying here this this is what was actually happening whoever's telling you you know uh, and whoever's putting together these books is consciously choosing to only um show these images it, it, it's mm. a it's a constant you know it's, it's a conscience uh a that choice it's a choice basically they, they, yeah. they are putting forward what you want to see a conscious choice so because they're trying to put this narrative out there of, of what they want you to see when the, the truth is so much richer and you know diverse as to what was really going on and, and that really that that bothers a certain number of people but we need to keep bothering them we we need to not let them try to put forward that story of you know this like medieval white utopia of of europe or the viking age and things like that because that's not that's not true that's not what it was and we just need to stop that one of my pr goals in the mobile museum exhibit is actually partnering with you know, really some of the best reenactors from all over the world to that that have because that's an arms and armor exhibit we're trying to focus mainly on like you know military personas or, or armored personas but i'm trying to include some really fantastic reenactors of, of of color and black reenactors of color to show to help exhibit like there was a greater diversity than, than what you think there was and there's a greater diversity of reenactors out there too it's not just yeah. it's not just a, an old white guy's hobby although i'm a lot of it is to be perfectly honest and and, and i mean uh, at, at, yeah. as, as an old white guy but i'm also um, an old white guy. <laughs> but, but you know, so that's, it, one, that's one of the goals as well yeah. but i mean i will admit trying to find a um reenactor of color with sort of a museum quality gear has been more of a challenge than I thought. And, and I think that's a disservice that the reenactment community has done. Um, but if anybody knows anyone uh, or that might want to be part of this project or is one, or um, I'd, I'd love to talk to you and see what you have. We're actually thinking about expanding it from the museum exhibit to go from Roman to, um, basically the uh revolution i guess you could say uh american revolution although 
usually the cutoff we're doing is about you know 1600 17 you know 17th century something like that as soon as we start mm -hmm. to get out of the armored combat uh phase of it but yeah I, i'm would love to love to talk to you um even if you don't want to be part of it if you know anybody that might want to be part of it please reach out to me i'll make sure andrew has the uh, all my contact information we'll put it down below in the um down below bit um yes thanks the down below no. bit down below bit that's the uh, new term for the channel um the down below <laughs> bit um no definitely definitely um and i think it's really important to, um you know to talk about um you know the interchange um and exchange of movement and migration through europe um uh, when this comes out hopefully you know when this when this is out Sorry, because um, this is re being recorded for the future. Um, we all have briefly talked about some of the movement and migration of people through Europe. Um, so you'll have watched this, Matt, and you'll know awesome. what I'm talking about. Um, but, you know, the idea that medieval people are just static and, and stayed only in their village is, is just a, a, a nonsense idea. Um, there was exchange of people um, and migration of people um, is, you know, pretty much from from the late 11th and 12th centuries. Once once Europe opened back up, um, once the once the Mediterranean is open again and um, Northern Europe's open again because it's all settled down. There's no more conflict with um, the quote unquote Vikings, and you know um, the Mediterranean settled down. Um, Europeans start heading east, opening up, settling and migrating, and that migration heads west. There's there's migration from um, and and movement from North Africa, and obviously um, an exchange and interchange with with Mediterranean countries um, and and the Levant as well, um, and we obviously see. Um, uh, people of color coming from, you know, um, Andalusia um, and and um, through from from, you know, Spain, dark colored people coming from Spain and, and northern Africa. So. And, and prior, obviously prior to that as well, um, you know, the Roman period. Um, Greece, uh, all the way to the ancient world. Yeah, so. I mean, yes. <laughs> yes. I'm, I'm, yes. I, I'm just. <laughs> I'm. I'm not trying to. I'm not trying to like make assertions without like having um, documentation. Um, but the reason why I'm just kind of sounding stilted is because there's. I, I don't need to. I don't really need to make these claims because there's, there's more than enough. There is more than enough. Um, detailed evidence of of movement of within the say for example within the Ro Roman Empire um, being you know of people who are not wholly white um, and and what whiteness is um, and within the Byzantine Empire um, you know quote unquote Byzantine you know, the Eastern and Western empires and things like that so um, and that happens within the medieval world as well um, so yeah that's um that's something that i i do talk about um obviously uh, in, in the, the video that's previous to this i mean i don't necessarily address what people of color is but um i definitely talk about the migration of peoples um and um yeah so it's not it's not something that that um i don't i definitely don't believe that uh, medieval people were sedentary because they weren't. No, we know. We know there were. I, there, I mean, there, there are industries set up specifically based on the travel of people. Yeah, <laughs> I, and the the whole the whole pilgrimage. Uh, I mean, by the late medieval period, the whole idea of a pilgrimage it, it did become sort of a commercialized venture. Yeah. So, and people were traveling 
thousands of miles sometimes for these mm. things. So it, yeah, the idea of, oh, people just stayed in their, their hovel all their life. Well, maybe, maybe some people did, but there was far more travel than what people like to believe there was. Yeah, uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, I just, uh, yeah, I just um, find it that laughable. There's, it's just one of those things that still isn't challenged when we're presented with the medieval period. Um, people never moved more than five kilometers from there or five miles from their their village and they just died there um <laughs> one yeah. of those assertions exactly um, yeah. and how whenever we find a whenever we find a grave and they'll you know it's like well this was like you know they'll feel like be up up in sweden or something like well, we found a grave of a, a we did the, we did the ran the bones and it was like a Lebanese woman. What was she doing all the way up there? And people are always shocked. Like, oh my gosh, what are they doing so far away? And it's like, because they, they traveled. Yeah. They, they, you know, it's like they, they made contacts yeah. and they traveled. Maybe not on holiday or something, but you know, <laughs> it, it's it's like they didn't just stay home all their lives not doing anything. There could be any number of reasons why she had traveled up there. Maybe, maybe she married you know, a Viking that came down. Maybe she's abducted by a Viking that came down. Who who knows? But yeah. the idea is like we always treat these things like, oh my gosh, it's so shocking so far away. It's like, no, that's not really that shocking. You know, I, I bet there's more bones than we've... This is something to go even back even further. My son's been really into Egypt lately. And mm. we've been watching things about, you know, Egyptian and, and pyramids and the tombs and everything like that. And I, I mentioned one day to my wife I'm like I'm just so amazed at how many tombs and how many skeletons are under Egypt and she's like well and there's Egypt's been around for thousands of years yeah <laughs> Mill millions of years it's like they didn't just start you know people didn't just stop dying 3,000 years ago <laughs> it's like if they've got thousands and thousands of years of people who died, it's like, and they'd have to do something with them. I'm like, yeah, that's fine. So it's like all these graves that we find, medieval graves that we find, you know, it's like, there's, there's more, there's obviously more out there. It, it's because there were, there were people, there's thousands of years of people who've died. So of course we're going to find, find there's more than we've ever found. And to say I, that like, yeah, well, you know, 1% of the five, 1% of the graves we ever found traveled more than five miles past their village it's like well we've only probably ever found two percent of all the graves ever out there yeah i mean just just on your like comment on on egypt um it's it's one of the oldest and enduring empires in in the world you know besides china um you know it, you of, of the civilizations you've got you've got china You've got Egypt, you have like the Mesopotamian Valley, which, you know, that that's all being like excavated. You've got the Indus Valley, so like you've got the, the, the major ones. Um, they were all interconnected through the Silk Road. And, you know, we've, we've got evidence of human migration from the, the Neolithic. Oh, and and trade as far back as the Neolithic, from from Africa all the way to potentially um, India, and and you know the 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 capacity of human migration and movement and trade as far back as that. So the idea that there there was not and has not been human migration and trade and movement that that far into europe is 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 a ridiculous assertion and to, to oh yeah i'm it's actually a good segue thinking about it tombs and graves and stuff so another one of the projects we're working on up here is um uh, history live northeast the name of my organization we've partnered with the university of maine uh, which is the, the the big university system here in maine the state university they have a basically a large capacity 
3D printer and 3D and, and 3D CNC machine, CNC mill. Working with the 3D scanning technology that I've been working with and sort of building things, we decided we're going to build a life-size tomb effigy. Oh, yes. Um, the night that we're calling it the night's tomb, of course. And what I've done is my, this, we just finished. So we, we, we just took the third round of pictures of this and we're running to try to get a better 3D scan of it. But I, I built a top that sits on top of my um, picnic table. <laughs> and what, what I've been doing is getting suited up in full armor, laying down on top of it. And then it's like this last time my wife went around me and took almost 500 pictures of me laying there still. I had to lay there for about an hour, perfectly still. That, that's actually harder to do in armor than you think it is. Um, and then we partnered with the University of Maine, and they're actually going to 3D print this thing life-size. Wow. And we're going to build a base on it, and we're going to take it to schools and libraries and, and use it as an educational tool because, especially for the medieval period, you know, tomb effigies, there's so much you can learn from them. Um, you know, technology advances – how things were put together, social status of people, how to identify social status of people, what sort of the societal norms of being buried of this time was for somebody of that upper that upper status, um, you know, things like that. And that sort of how to analytically look at objects like that to see what you can learn from it. So that's going to be a lot of fun. Um, and we, we are running them just to do a, a, a fundraising plug. Oh, yes. <laughs> go, go, go. We're the base of it we're designing. Please. So the base on this has 26 shields. And we're selling the shields for 100 US dollars a shield. And it's a fundraiser to sort of fund the whole project. But it's almost like an, if you ever been to like a library or a university or something or a school where they're like, name a brick. You know, if you pay $500 or $1,000, you get your name printed on this brick and it either goes in the wall of the building or it goes on like a path in front of it or something like that. And it's a way for them to build, to raise money for the, for the building costs. So that's kind of what we're doing with these shields. So these shields uh, for $100 a piece will put your arms on the shields, then it will be decorating the base of the effigy and the arms will then be keyed into the app I mentioned earlier that we're developing. So when the people look at it, it'll bring up sort of a donor list, you know, a, a donor armorial showing the arms and listing the names that are attached to them as, as who donated the money to get this project done. So again, if you're interested in being part of that, um, reach out. We still have 10, sh 11 shields left. We still have 11 shields left at this time. So if you're interested, please, I'd lo love to have your arms on it. I think it's going to be really, really cool once we get it done. It is, that's very cool. Very, very cool. Um, I should probably get my arms all sorted out so I can add myself to the list. Yeah. <laughs> it's been on my Pressure's list. on now. It is. It is. It is definitely on. Um, well, no, that's been great. I really appreciate uh, you popping in. We're... Um, running close to time um so i guess we'll do just some final thoughts and uh we'll wrap up so um final thoughts final thoughts um if you want to do this awesome do it uh, whether it's just being a reenactor whether it's being a living history interpreter whether it's trying to do lectures start your own group get out there awesome please reach out. I'm happy to help you in any way I can. Have a plan. Be flexible enough with the plan where if things go sideways or take longer than you imagine that you can roll with it. Be ready to be told no a lot. I mean, I'm constantly applying for grants to fund all of this. And I, I'm nine times out of 10, I'm told no. So be ready for that. Be ready for to explain yourself to the public, what you're trying to do. Present yourself in a professional manner um, because it just it does. Believe it or not, it does make things easier for you. If you look like you're somebody and sound like you're somebody who knows what they're talking about, 
it makes it so much easier for you. Know what you're talking about because again, that'll just make it easier for you, but get your name out there, collaborate, reach out to people like Andrew reaching out to me to do this or stuff I do with Ari. Um, collaborate because again, again, it helps you get your name out there. Have a good support system behind you, even if it's just for emotional support, because there are days where I look at this and I say, I'm done. I quit. I'm going to go. I'm going to just go back to working a desk job. I can't do this anymore. And I know looking back at that, I'd be absolutely miserable and I don't want to do that. But those days do come. And remember to have fun. There are days, there are weeks where I don't dress up in armor. And I don't go out in the field and clo funny clothes and do fun stuff. I'm sitting at a desk writing, reading, you know, applying for grants. And that's not the fun stuff. Take the time to do some of the fun stuff too. Because th this literally is a passion project. Uh, there's that old saying of, you know, love what you do and you never work in a day. That's a lie. Love what you do and you will work 10 times harder than you've ever worked at anything in your life. <laughs> because you want to make it succeed but remember to do the fun stuff and take a break every once in a while uh, because it, it, it will wear you out what else um enjoy yourself because it's awesome i mean really we're nerds playing dress up we really are that's what it is <laughs> don't take yourself too seriously in any of this because we are nerds playing dress up and i know a lot of people out there be like oh you know i'm a, i'm a I'm a historian and I work for this big museum and I get paid to dress up and, and give lectures. And I, you know, I, I'm very serious. Like we're all just nerds playing dress up and it's awesome. And we need to be okay with that. I don't know. I don't know, Andrew, anything else? No, I, no, I think that's uh, well put. We'll put definitely nerds, definitely nerds and dress up. Um, I couldn't agree more with that one and uh, not taking yourself seriously um, yeah. and um, definitely have fun, uh, which will bring me to my segue, which is. Um, so remember, everyone, um, if you do uh, want to join us for any of our popular Barnum chats, uh, please contact me. Um, email us at popularbarnum at gmail.com. Um, um, thanks, Matt. Um, I really appreciate you popping in. Uh, I'll put Matt's contact details in the thing below. Um, <laughs> um, you know, for his many, many different programs um, and projects, uh, definitely reach out to Matt if you um, have any questions or um, can help him out with his many, many different projects or are looking to start your own project as well. Um, and um, yeah, thank you so much for popping in. Thank you very much for sharing your time with us today. Um, oh, thank you for thank you for having me. I, I always love talking with you. No, 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 it's my pleasure. Um, you know, your time is uh, very precious. So anytime you share it with us is is always appreciated. Um, and um, yeah, well, thank you so much for coming along. Oh, I didn't see you there. That must mean you must have enjoyed the video. So why don't you like, comment, and subscribe. And remember, stay safe, have fun, and keep reenacting.